Welcome once again to another edition of the Catholic View for Women, where we give you news and views from a truly Catholic perspective. I'm Teresa Tamio, along with my co-host Astrid Bene Gutierrez from the Vida Initiative, where she serves as the executive director, and of course, Janet Morana, who serves as the executive director of Priest Your Life and the co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. Both ladies very familiar, of course, to both our EWTN radio and TV listeners. Now, before we go any further in getting into our topic, which will be diving into the second part of our interview with Sue Ellen Browder, who is an author, a speaker, former magazine writer, and now a convert to Catholicism. We do want to thank our wonderful spiritual or pastoral advisor, Father Frank Pavone, who helps us come up with the ideas, develops the programs, and also makes sure that we are dotting our I's and crossing the T's when That's it comes right. to Catholic teaching. So thanks to, to Father Frank Pavone from Priest Your Life. We're going to be talking about Sue Ellen's conversion, how a radical feminist converted to Catholicism. And it's important to note that although she did at one point work for Cosmopolitan magazine and was really at the cusp of the whole sexual revolution movement right. and how the sexual mm -hmm. revolution and the women's movement became entwined, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting story. But we do want to remind folks that this is in no way an endorsement for magazines such as Cosmopolitan magazine just the opposite. Yes, this is right. really a warning that is going out to you, especially if you have children, mm -hmm. especially if you have teens, to make sure that you understand that this type of a publication is just wreaking havoc, not only with young people, but with women and, and with society. And as we said you know, in our last episode, we were really delving into uh, how Sue Ellen really, she said, we made up all those stories you know, about women uh, going out on a date and, and going to bed with guys and going from relationship to relationship. That was all part of what it was meant to be a woman. you know. And she said, we made it up. They weren't actually women we were writing about. But we made the the reader think it was. They even described when you read the book in, in her book Subverted. They even described in those articles the apartments, the clothes they wore, what right. they were doing, and yeah. how they they lived their life. They had, supposedly had this fancy apartment in New York City or other major metropolitan areas, and went home. It's just it's but it's, it but was invented. It was invented. completely invented. But then within about five to ten years, they started discovering a lot of women that were living. This lifestyle, not if, of course, as exclusively as some of these these mm -hmm. fictional characters that they came up with in their magazine articles, because people can't afford to live like that. Right. New York City is extremely expensive, but the lifestyle in terms of the sexual promiscuity, promiscuity. thinking that's that right. that was when going to give them. When they were writing it, they thought it was you know harmless entertainment. They they didn't think that they were going to wreak havoc on women's lives because they weren't talking about what happens later, the abortions, the STDs, the contraception, and and all the fallout. So it wasn't until later that she discovers um, exactly what. They had unleashed with the She uh, didn't magazine. think it was harmful. She thought, well, this is what you do when you get mm -hmm. to New York, even though that right. Sue Ellen studied it at a very prestigious journalism school. But don't you think that the powers that be knew exactly what they were doing? Of oh, course yeah. they did. It was propaganda. It, yeah, it was, it was yeah. definitely, definitely mm -hmm. planned. Mm -hmm. And we have to consider the fact that, um, you know, Sue Ellen stayed in that mindset for a while. And the opposite thing was she was raising her two children and baking cookies for them and planting a vegetable garden while she was writing this over-sexualized trash, basically, of lies. And just like the women who were trying to aspire to live that way, they were finding, like you just said, Astrid, that you know, doing this abortion and contraception was a downward spiral. The same thing was happening to Sue Ellen while she was writing those stories, that she kind of you know, kept seeing herself mm -hmm. like, how much can you keep lying to you say, you know what, I have to stop it. And that's kind of like what happened to her. And we got to talk to her uh, recently. At the uh, March for Life. At the March for Life. She was one Life. of the keynote speakers. She yeah. was one of the keynote speakers. And let's take a look in her words, what she had to say about how she ended up coming out of all that and actually becoming uh, Catholic. a great Catholic. Go figure. Go figure. Let's see. We've got all these women out there who supposed feminists who are su supposedly su supporting women who are defending abortion. Well, a whole bunch of them have had abortions. And they can't face the fact that what they did, what, they can't face the fact of what they did. And so uh, I was in that department. That's the way I was too. And, you know, it took a long, long, long time before. The day I had my abortion, we did it on a lunch hour. Walter and I were both working at a uh, at uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, temporary jobs, and uh, you could get an abortion on your lunch hour, and I did. And the doctor, this was a year after Roe v. Wade, and he was furious. It was at Hartford Hospital, and he was furious that he was having to do these abortions. 
and he didn't let the anesthesia set. He, he, did it. He, he wanted me to hurt. And uh, when he, uh, as, as, during the abortion, he said, I usually deliver them alive. And the, the nurse that was holding my hand thought I'd died. I, my, my, I froze when he said that. And my, and my eyes just kind of stared straight ahead. And the nurse said, Sue, Sue, are you OK? Are you OK? I, I knew she thought I'd died. But uh, um, yeah. So at that point, after that, I mean, I wasn't happy with it from the beginning, OK? And then I, at home, things happened. I think I, it's, it's all in my book how my parents had three children. And so when I'd set the table, we'd set it for five people. I started setting the, the table for five. And then I'd like, five? Why five? Well, there's only four of us. And then I'd take that plate back that I had uh, set for that child that wasn't there. I never even spoke about the abortion. Uh, I couldn't. And, and Walter and I never spoke about it. And it was when we came into the Catholic Church, the first time that we decided we were going to become Catholics, we went to our, our priest, Father Bruce Lamb, and the first uh, talk we had with him, Walter said, we've had an abortion. And I was, I was, I was amazed that he said it, He's, uh, because until that point, I thought I was suffering with that abortion all by myself. And it turned out that he was suffering with me, right along with me, because we were, we were together on pretty much everything, and we were together on that, too. And I think he thought that that was going to be the magic bullet that was going to keep us from being Catholics. I think he thought the priest is going to say, ah, oh, well, if you did that, forget it, you're out of here, because everybody has this belief that the Catholic Church is this monstrous ugly thing that doesn't like women so who've had abortions. Well, we don't want women to have abortions, but the Catholic Church is the church that heals women from abortions. So after we came into the church, it was about six weeks later, I realized that I still hadn't talked to Father Bruce about that abortion. And I decided it was time, and I was really scared. I mean, my knees were shaking and to go to confession for, to him for that. And uh, he was a real tough, he's a real tough priest. He's a great, great, great priest. And, but he, he was kind of scary to me as a new Catholic. And so I went in, and, and he didn't know who I was. But usually we, we did confession face to face in this little church that I was in. But this one I did behind the screen, and I could hear him asking. In his mind, he was trying to figure out who this was. And so finally, I let him off the hook. I said, well, I'm a new convert. And I could hear him go, ah. <laughs> and so he, I, he was very gentle with me. And he uh, told me that that baby was, even Christ, was still alive. And that really freaked me out, because I'm like, do I really want to meet this person that I killed? And uh, he said, well, he reasoned with me. He said, would you rather? that he not be alive, the baby not be alive? And I said, well, no, of course not. And so he said, for your penance, I want you to go home, and I want you to think about how much God loves you. What a beautiful penance. I always thought penances were these horrible things where you had to chop off your leg or something, you know? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. This is my first con real confession in the church. And uh, so I went home, and I contemplated how God, much God loves me and the joy that fell th flowed through me and the grace of the Holy Spirit. And it was very healing. And now today, I can talk about it without um, being afraid. Oh, there, there's so Powerful. much There's so much to discuss <clears throat> yeah. in, in that right. interview. In that well, clip. of course, when we did the interview, uh, we were, of course, in my, my suite there at the hotel, and the women of Silent No More were there, and Sue got to meet with them and talk to them, and she even uh, asked for one of the signs, I regret my abortion, and she, we were taking pictures together. It was like a whole sisterhood was going on, and she said, she goes, you know, I've started talking about it, and I'm going to keep talking about it more. She goes, because, of course, I regret that abortion. And she said, uh, it was just, and notice about Walter. Her husband. They yeah. never spoke about it, and that is so common. I know you, you mm -hmm. come across this too, Astrid. Uh, I do, especially because of uh, my work with Silent No More, is that 
that stays buried down deep inside of them. Couples will, will just not even talk about it for decades. And then suddenly they're, they're seeking yes. healing and it comes out. And the men have been so silent. You saw it, Walter. All those years, he never said a word. And but then I'm, he said we had an abortion. We. Did you notice yes, that? Yes, we. Yes. He took ownership from right. his part. Mm -hmm. We had an abortion. And like she said, oh, well, he thought that was going to be a game changer for coming into the church, which is just the opposite. The doors of the right. church are it open. It breaks my heart to hear that. that I know. That um, how many people are out there thinking that they've committed the unforgivable sin, sin right, that's and right. don't take that step. And one thing that I noticed about her book, which is so well written, one theme that I just noticed popped out is that um, God made us to, to love him and serve him. So if, you, if you're not serving God in his church, you have this void and you're going to fill it with something. Right. And what women are filling it with, it, what she uh, began to fill it with, was, was the idea of sex being the God. Sex, sex and also success, and success, because that's what they were selling in, in magazines like Cosmo. Yeah. Yes, but you're, yeah. still, you're hungry and thank God she took that turn and, and leap of faith to join the church. And now do you see her face, how, how happy and peaceful she is to have... Uh, healed herself and found the truth. Yeah. Now, we're calling this episode a radical feminism. A feminist converts to Catholicism. And, and if you think about this dual life mm -hmm. that she led, you mentioned at the beginning of the program, Janet, about how Sue Ellen in, in our last episode talked about planting a garden, making cookies for her right. two kids, baking bread, yeah. being happily married. She was married to the, the same man her home life. He, he, he died a, a few years uh, before the book came out. But right. just a beautiful, she had a wonderful relationship mm -hmm. with her husband, and then they went through this whole conversion process. But the, the point really is, is to, to underscore that so many women, like many of us, and I considered myself when I was in college a radical feminist, yeah. and I know in many ways you did too, mm -hmm. that we were caught up in that cycle. But what gives us the peace and what brings us the most mm -hmm. hope and the most fulfillment? Mm -hmm. And that's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. Said, of that's all right. things. I, I mean, it, it's, it's just so amazing to me right. the way that this comes out over and over and mm -hmm. over again, but the world doesn't hear these types of stories. That's right. I, lo I love your quote that you have to say um, about the best place for a woman is in the arms, arms of, of Christ Jesus. in the Catholic Church. Exactly. That's right. a testament right. to her, yeah. her story. Well, I just want to remind, you know, some of our viewers, maybe they know someone who has been silent about their regret about abortion. They haven't gone mm -hmm. through healing. They feel alienated from the church, that they can take those first steps. And at our Silent No More website, there's a special page called abortionforgiveness.com. You can put your zip code in there, and you can see where is the nearest Rachel's Vineyard, where is the nearest uh, pregnancy center that has a, a post-abortion healing mm -hmm. program out of it. Because I think we have to really get that message out. Look at how many years that uh, Sue Ellen and Walter stayed silent and alienated. I mean, they weren't in the Catholic Church, but they weren't practicing any faith, really. Mm -hmm. And so we want to kind of, it's kind of like a reach out to say, come back, come home. Uh, there's a place for you here, you know. Uh, and she yeah. also details in the book what started leading them to the Catholic Church. Right. Actually, her husband became interested in the church at first. And then she started teaching, well, I don't want to join that, you know, that yeah. chauvinistic right. you know, old yeah. institution. Then she started reading some of the documents to find out what her husband was getting into. And then she too was like, wow, this yeah. is, this is this unbelievable. Is, this yeah, is beautiful. Something more solid. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think encouragement to people out there who maybe they just tuned into EW Chan and they're not Catholic, or maybe they've been away from the faith for a while. Maybe they know someone who's away from the faith that if people like us, and then someone like a Sue Ellen who was really caught up in the middle of, of this whole sexual revolution and woman's lib cycle can come around, come out of that and then convert then there's hope for, for there's any hope of us. For, for mm -hmm. And that's, us. that's the yeah. reason why she's doing this book. The other thing, too, I think, is, is just to understand, and we can't underscore this and emphasize this enough, that much of what we have been fed, whether it's about the women's movement, whether it's about abortion, whether it's about birth control, whether it's about sexual promiscuity, has been invented, that's right. created. They want the lies to continue, and so many people buy those lies. And they've, it's become part of the language, the lies, especially in the abortion industry. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and especially dealing with the, the abortifacian contraception, starting with the pill. I mean, we've covered this before mm -hmm. in our programs, but, I mean, the lies are still out there. And talking about Cosmo, how bad Cosmo is, the ads in Cosmo magazine for birth control pills, every kind of device, the, the implants, the patches, the pills, everything. And when you look, I mean... God's way is the right way because the church has our best interests at heart. But if you look in depth, like I did in my book, Recall mm -hmm. Abortion, a full chapter on medically, what are those devices mm -hmm. and all that, that contraceptive hormones doing to us as women? Well, first of all, they're group one carcinogens and they're harming us. And yet. And how come there isn't a birth control pill? You talk about sexist, you talk about for men. Versus, why, why don't the men <laughs> have men, a pill? Right. I don't see men going around swallowing these pills that no. are going to cause them all kinds of problems. No, just the women. And so, you know, it's really the church that has your 
as a woman, your best interest at heart, both for your health and your spirituality and your and and psychologically too, because. When you you're go down that road and take the pill and do all that stuff, you're, you're being treated, you're objectified by men because then it's all about sex and not about caring about you as a human being and who you really are. And we the have the best kept secret in the church. And why is it a best kept secret, women. though? That's what drives me crazy. Because we're not sharing it. Enough. I'll put it on right. myself. Yes. No, all of all us, us, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, no. We have to. And that's, and that's the reason we began this program. It's, that's right. It's, and still so many, we think because we do this day in and day out, mm -hmm. right? That more people, and a lot of, thanks to networks like EWTN and apostolates like, like yours, people are learning, but it's still a niche community, don't you That's think? Right. It's it not is. big enough. And I still run into so many people, as I'm sure you ladies do mm -hmm. on the speaking circuit, who say, I never heard this before. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, And I just speak wherever I go about it. That's right. You. That's the only thing Even we can at do. the beauty parlor, uh, a <laughs> beauty salon. Hair salon. Hair salon. Hair beauty salon. Paula. Hair I salon. got one, one of the girl, uh, one of the shampoo girls was talking to me about it, and I got her to stop using the birth control pill when I started telling her medically what this could be doing to her. And then she was like, I had no idea. I said, well, and I pointed to her at the websites where she could get more information. And the next time I went into the salon, she said, you know what, Janet? I went back to my doctor and I said, I can't take the birth control pill anymore. I said, well, praise God. Praise the Lord. Now stop sleeping with your boyfriend and we'll really... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing at a time, One right? thing at a time. <laughs> One step at a time. <laughs> what a gift. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the conversion of a former radical feminist to Catholicism. She's the author of a great book, and we'll tell you how to get her book subverted. Stay tuned. More Catholic, Con Catholic Connection. Well, that's my radio show. Well, Catholic View for Women coming up on EWTN. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Catholic View for Women. Teresa Tamio, along with Astrid Bene Gutierrez and Janet Morana. We're talking about Sue Ellen Browder, the author of a great book, Subverted, and her conversion from radical feminism to Catholicism. And you're learning in this episode, in the past episode, and in episodes coming up in this season, and also from the book, and how this former writer for Cosmopolitan Magazine, of all things, got tired of the lies and the propaganda promoted by her own industry, and specifically that magazine, and decided, you know what, things have to change in my life, and that she needed to help change the culture, and that's what she's doing. Yes, and she's incredible. I'm just incredible. fascinated by her story and how she was such a smart woman. I mean, yeah. really, truly seeking, so bright, um, and a and a big heart, you know, yeah. really. But even she could fall into the lies of things that were happening in you know the 60s and 70s, a humanist manifesto, all these things that were coming out, telling people that. 
that you know sex and and financial success in the world that's all you we're, need. The, we're the gods yeah. you know and and uh, contemplating that but then realizing uh, in the end that truly she is a child of God and therein lies her her happiness and hope for her wounds. And I, I just love one of the passages here where she talks about her second confession, um, where she uh, shares about the sin of abortion with the priest and just the, the way she felt, I think most of us um, can, can, you know, can, can uh, feel relate the way, to. yeah, relate yeah. to, because, because uh, it's so liberating. So here's what uh, she says, um, at this very hour, after a quarter century of unspoken grief over the abortion, I at last begin to feel healed. The church, in her all-forgiving love, is so beautiful that I feel as if I'm living inside a 2,000-year-old poem. Unharnessed, I leave the confessional and walk through the church door into a new day filled with the light of a freedom from fear I have never known before. Wow. And that's the power of the sacrament and the church. And, and I love what she says, 2,000-year-old poem, poem, which means oh, it's just beautiful, I know. it's intricate, right. it's everything your soul longs for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, we experienced this, um, the same reaction from the women who have kept that secret so so long. And it's usually their lives just hit like rock bottom where they're reaching. And it's only God, you know, who can bring them back up out of that, you know, from committing that. Testimony sin of after testimony, testimony at the Supreme Court. They every year at the March for Life. You hear. You hear this this trail that they're, this path that they take where they're trying to figure out what is wrong with their life. Their right. life is spinning out of control. And yet, regardless, nobody that they're they're trying, you know, with whom they're trying to speak or seek help from, nobody is saying it could have been the, it could right. have been the abortion. Right, right. Well, because when you, if you go for counseling, I mean, unless you're going to a Christian counselor that recognizes, but if you're just saying I can't sleep or I'm having eating disorder or all these other problems, you're just going for regular mm -hmm. counseling. They, they, connect they don't the connect it to the abortion. And they're taught actually. And they're to, scripting to them it. with antidepressant yeah. drugs and all this other stuff. And so many of these women lived so many years, like, seeking, seeking, seeking. And it's usually when they hit that rock hit bottom rock place. Bottom. Yeah. That it's only God is the answer. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that, you know, when we do do interviews with the media, they always say to me, uh, well, Janet, uh, why did all the women keep talking about God? And I said, because it's only Jesus Christ who died on the cross, redeemed us, can truly bring that forgiveness to them, that mercy. You know, especially that you know, we're here in that year of mercy. I mean, it's shining that light on this is not an unforgivable sin like well, they're made to believe. What really moved me when we were interviewing her at, during the March for Life when she said that she was setting the table for five. So yeah. instinctively, yes. She's, yes. she's recognizing she that child. Well, she has, you know, two born living children, but one in heaven that she lost to abortion, mm -hmm. you know. And so they never forget. The women never forget that child. Uh, that they that they lost to abortion, they never do. They never forget the day uh, that they had that abortion, the day the child should have been born. But what happens is they're in a better place. Mm. They're in a better place. They know Jesus has forgiven them. And then the next step, and that's why they need things like Rachel's Vineyard or a healing program, because then they have to learn to forgive themselves. You see, it's one thing to accept Jesus' forgiveness and mercy, but then you have to go deeper and forgive yourself. And that's what, uh, why I encourage people to go to that, that webpage, abortionforgiveness.com, put in your zip code and see where there's a Rachel's Vineyard or a healing program. But in her book, there is one more quote I'd like to read, because um, she refers to... Um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who, being yes. from New York, mm -hmm. one of my favorites. And, you know, she, she's talking about the, the conversion and then years later how she, she thought of this quote from Sheen in a different light. Listen to what she says. What happened next was very strange and only explained to me years later when I read a quote from Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And here's the quote. The nearer Christ comes to a heart, Sheen wrote, the more it becomes conscious of its own guilt. It will then either ask for his mercy and find peace or it will, and, or it will turn against him because it is not ready to give up its sinfulness. Thus, he will separate the good from the bad, the wheat from the chaff. Man's reaction to this divine presence will be the test. Either it will call out all the opposition of egotistic natures or else galvanize them into a regeneration 
and a resurrection. Wow. So very You know, you can see that struggle that goes that on struggle. every year. I, I'm going back to the Supreme Court and right. the testimonies of the women and men from South No More because you've got the group from South No More, then you have the protesters who are so angry. Exactly. And, and, and there, you can see their pain. And, and that's what this uh, Fulton Sheen quote wow. is saying. It's two mm -hmm. sides and you're either going to go this way or that. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, I know we don't have much time here, but I just want to point out our beautiful uh, Kitchen Madonna available at the Religious Catalog. And she, of course, is our patroness for these programs. The kettle uh, reminds us that uh, she keeps the, us nourished in body and soul. And then we have the broom, which of course keep the house clean, but also keep us clean with thoughts uh, and our thoughts and our, and our actions. And finally, she has the keys here to the, the kingdom, keep the house safe, but also the keys to, to, to heaven, to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Available at the religious catalog in bronze. And she's I'm, so pretty in bronze. So I really like that. Well, it's beautiful, but I like the bronze. I it's do really too. Nice. And of course, I know we all have them in our homes. And yes. uh, she has a very positive influence around the dinner table. Those religious images, very yep. important. And of course, now our homework, uh, first thing, of course, is to get Sue Ellen Browder's book, Subverted, available at the EWTN Religious Catalog. I highly recommend it. Please, everyone read it, especially your young daughters. They'll learn a lot. Uh, two, of course, Teresa's book, uh, Tree Makeover, is also, they're like a companion, those two yeah. books. Uh, also available at the Religious Catalog. And uh, Teresa, you were, wrote a beautiful uh, devotional for women called Walk, Walk Softly, Softly and, and Carry, carry a, a Great, great bag. bag. Also available at the EWTN Religious Catalog. And of course, Visiting our website, thecatholicviewforwomen.com, for more information. You can uh, get previous episodes up there. You can also uh, uh, see our discussion questions and homework is all there. Plus, sign up to receive our monthly newsletter. And finally, if you're on Facebook, like The Catholic View for Women. Yeah, and we can't encourage you enough to get Sue Ellen's book. It's, it's one of the best ones mm -hmm. I've read in a long time, and especially, and I know there are plenty of women out there, even though maybe you're in the church and active in the church, all of us have some vestige of the way we've been impacted That's by right. the culture, mm -hmm. and we fight with it every day. And the messages from the world are so prominent. But let me tell you something, ladies. They're majority, nine out of ten times, we've been lied to. And enough is enough. And that's why we're doing these programs. That's, that's why right. I recommend mm -hmm. these books, especially Sue Ellen's book, Subverted. You won't regret it. Thanks for tuning in. As Janet and Astrid said, we have all this information on our website at thecatholicviewforwomen.com. Check it out. Use the resources. Go to the documents that we put up there. The church is there for us. The church upholds the dignity of women like nobody else. And we are daughters and sons for the guys out there that are watching, right. of the King. And don't you forget it. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Thanks for watching The Catholic View for Women. On behalf of my co-host, Janet Marana and Astrid Bene Gutierrez, we'll see you next time on The Catholic View. Have a great day or evening, whatever time it is in your part of the world. See you next time.